Hello, everybody. I hope you are well. Uh, it is Tuesday. It is Tuesday. I apologize. I've been running around today and uh, yeah, so just getting ready for all the stuff that uh, the changes and everything coming at, uh, you know, with St. Mary's and then here at St. Gabriel, St. Bridget. So um, yeah, I have had absolutely no time to prepare for this evening and I'll, I'll definitely answer a couple questions. So, so certainly uh, I don't want to start off the thing by like saying, I'm going to waste your time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just been a busy day. It's been a busy couple of weeks and, and uh, appreciate everyone's patience and prayers and certainly know of mine uh, for everyone. And so why don't we uh, go ahead and start tonight with, uh, as we always do with prayer in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us uh, each and every day to breathe in your Holy Spirit, to breathe in your life, to live in your Son, and to be loved by you, Father. Fill our hearts, minds, and souls with your breath, with the life of your Son, and with your love. We ask especially uh, that you continue to watch over our parishes, continue to guide all our steps, to protect our families, uh, and to grant us all peace and joy uh, in these times. And pray especially for our parish's staffs at St. Gabriel, St. Bridget, and St. Mary's. Pray that... Uh, for peace in the midst of anxiety and transition uh, over them especially. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, I hope everyone is well, as I say. Um, trying to think uh, what's been kind of going on lately. Uh, this past last week, uh, we had priest convocation down in southern Indiana. So normally we actually stay at uh, St. Meinrad, which is always wonderful because almost all the priests in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis went to St. Meinrad Seminary and School of Theology. Uh, and there's, in fact, you know, not just many priests, but many of our lay folks have gone uh, to get certifications through St. Meinrad, um, as well as working on uh, graduate studies, master's level studies at St. Meinrad as well. A lot of our religious, uh, like our DREs, um, youth ministers, those, those sorts of people, like people in Melissa's role, a lot of folks in Melissa's role uh, go down there. Um, of course, we have the same minor forms, all of our deacons, our permanent deacons. Um, and then they also do One Bread, One Cup, which uh, our, our, our youth have kind of gone to at some, at, at some points in our history. Um, right now, we're not currently using One Bread, One Cup, but it is a great summer program. Um, so like I said, though, normally we, we go down to St. Minor, but Unfortunately and, and suspiciously, there was a big scheduling conflict, uh, so they didn't have room for the the priests um, from the archdiocese, which they are all priests of the archdiocese as well down at St. Minard. So I think it was just a, a bit of a miscommunication. So we actually stayed in French Lick, which was really neat. Um, I had not, ever, I've never stayed at that uh, hotel, but all the priests, we all stayed in French Lick and it was wonderful. And we had a wonderful speaker, um, Father Brett. Brennan, I think is his last name. Uh, he is the author of the book To Save a Thousand Souls. Uh, so just a wonderful, wonderful priest uh, filled with wisdom. And uh, certainly uh, it was clear that he loved the Lord and, and, and he knew very well that the Lord loved him. So it was wonderful to hear from him. Um, but but yeah, so, so we were down there. It was a great, great convocation. It's always good to be with the brother priests, uh, especially together with the archbishop. Um, <clears throat> this was actually uh, the first convocation that the Archbishop has been to in, in a couple years. Last year uh, at the annual convocation, last minute he had to stay home. He came down, he got really sick, um, and, and so he couldn't make it down. It was just bedridden for a few days, it sounded like. So he had a pretty tough last year, and I know he greatly missed being with us. So he was really excited to be down with us this year. Um so, so, yeah, it was a wonderful convocation. Um, and then uh, yesterday I was at the, the, the parent of a priest. 
So the mother of one of a very good priest friend of mine, Father Sean Danda, Catherine Danda is her name. She passed away and her funeral mass was yesterday. Um, and it was a wonderful mass. Uh, it's, it's always something, you know, like it, it probably seems obvious that priests would always try to go to another priest's funeral. So like when one of my brother priests passes away, I really try and make an effort to get to that funeral mass if I'm able. Um, but, but it's also an expectation that all priests would make an effort to get to funeral masses of our parents. So like when my father passed away, a lot of priests were there. Uh, even when my brother passed away, a lot of priests were there. So uh, it really is wonderful. And it was a great, great uh, opportunity to just pray with Father Sean. One of the neat things um, that, uh, that Father Sean brought up in his homily. Um, so when a priest is ordained, I may have mentioned this on a previous Q&A, but, but when a priest is ordained, um, there's two things, you know, among all these things that he has to make sure that he has. But, but two things in particular that every priest is going to make sure that they have uh, by their ordination. One is called a manaturgium. And manaturgium is just a Latin word that just means hand towel. Um, and then also they, they want to have their uh, confession stole. And it's called their first confession stole. So not that uh, we as priests are going to confession for the first time, but the first confession that we will hear, the stole that we'll wear during that, that first confession that we ever hear. So they always want to make sure that they have a manaturgium and a first confession stole. So the stole, for obvious reasons, when they hear that, that confession. The manaturgium, uh, Latin, as I say, for hand towel, it's used to wipe off the chrism. Uh, so after the ordination of a priest, the archbishop consecrates the hands, the palms of a priest or the bishop, in our case, an archbishop. So he'll smear chrism all over the palms of the hands of the newly ordained priest, consecrating these hands or the priest's hands for uh, the mysteries, uh, handling the sacred mysteries of our faith, most especially the Eucharist. And so after that chrism is smeared on the hands of the priest, the priest then, the newly ordained priest, wipes off all that chrism onto the manaturgium, the hand towel. And then at, uh, usually, like at some point at the, right at the end of the mass of Thanksgiving, so the priest's first mass, he'll present the manaturgium, and then that stole he wore when he heard his first confession. He'll present the manaturgium to his mother and the first confession stole to his father. And then, as I say, Father Danda mentioned at his mother's funeral yesterday uh, that at his ordination, he or right after his ordination, at his Mass of Thanksgiving, he presented his mother with the manaturgium. Um, and our parents are buried with these items. Uh, so if you ever have a chance or would, ha would ever have a chance, not that you necessarily would, but if, if, if you ever have a chance to attend like a visitation of the parent of a priest who has passed away, um, they, you'll notice in the casket with them is usually some container, if it's the dad, containing the first confession stole, if it's the mother, a container containing the manaturgium. Uh, so it was really neat. I was really glad they brought that up. Uh, yesterday. And so kind of as the pious legend goes that when uh, a parent, when my mother or like when my father passed away, uh, the the pious legend goes is that the uh, or on the, the the day of judgment, when the they resurrect from the dead, that the Lord will ask them as a parent, what did you sacrifice for me and my church? And, and it's really coming from like, the Lord has given us life. So you remember that gospel passage, like the 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 uh, the master giving the talents to his servants right one gets 10 one gets five one gets one and in in and, and the one that was given 10 made 10 more the one that was given five made five more and the one who was given one just buried it and didn't do anything with it and so this is kind of the basis for this kind of pious legend of the priest that the lord would approach the parent of the priest at at, the, at their day of judgment and say, what have you sacrificed for me and my church? With that basic assumption, right, that the Lord has given them life. They themselves, he's given them life. He has given them the 10 talents. How did you go and grow that and, and increase the kingdom, so to speak? And then they'll be able to produce either in the father's case, the stole, or in the mother's case, the manaturgium. And they'll say, I sacrificed my child and gave them to you in the service of the priesthood, your priesthood, Lord. 
And so it's a really cool kind of pious legend. And it's something all of us priests take great pride in. Um, and, and that tradition had probably gone away for a little bit, but I'm very, very glad uh, that it's come back probably in the last 20, 30 years. And, and I, I don't know if it's ever fully gone away, but, but it's a really cool thing. And I know uh, that our parents greatly appreciated uh, receiving something like that on that day. And then, um, yeah. So, so father, father Danda mentioned that in his homily yesterday uh, at, at his mother's funeral, that she's being buried with his manaturgium, the hand towel that he wiped off the chrism from his newly consecrated hands from. So, so yeah, uh, that's a little bit about me kind of in my personal life, so to speak, and, and uh, priestly life. So uh, otherwise I'm, I'm swamped <laughs> with getting ready. Uh, Personally, I feel, you know, just that it, it feels overwhelming at this point. Um, just like that I'm staring down this this huge wave that's just waiting to kind of crash. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm truth be told, I'm kind of tired of looking at the wave. I'm ready for just July 5th to get here uh, and, and, and let's get rolling with this. And so in that and, and, and that being said, I'm very excited um, about this transition, very excited about uh, also being pastor of St. Mary's, very excited about you guys, many of you uh, getting to meet Father Matthew and our parish is having an associate pastor, especially Father Matthew Peroni. Uh, so he'll be out here. He has the morning mass, one last mass at his parish on July 5, and that's a Wednesday. So he'll have the morning mass at St. Monica, and then he'll be out here by noon uh, starting to kind of move all his stuff into the rectory in Rushville. And then uh, he'll be here at St. Gabriel on that Wednesday night. He'll preside at the 6 p.m. Mass, and then we'll have a uh, reception for him. And so just to make a plug for all those kind of meet and greets, on Wednesday, July 5, there will be a uh, Mass at St. Gabriel. That'll be Mass at 6 p.m. with a meet and greet. Uh, in honor of Saint, or in honor of Father Matthew, God willing, one day Saint Matthew. Um, but in honor of Father Matthew, so give everyone a chance to meet and greet him over at the Knights of Columbus immediately following Mass on July sixth. There will be a six thirty p.m. Mass at Saint Mary's in Rushville. All preside at that Mass, um, and then we'll have a combined meet and greet uh, for Father Matthew and I, where we'll get a chance to meet the parishioners of Saint Mary's in Rushville. Uh, and so that'll be 6.30 on Thursday, July 6, and that'll be in Rushville. 6.30 p.m. Mass, followed by a little reception. Uh, and then Friday evening, July 7th, St. B's, uh, St. Bridget's, uh, we'll have a Mass there. Uh, Father Matthew will preside. That'll be at 6 p.m. Um, and then there will be a game night with Father Matthew present and also just kind of an opportunity for parishioners in, in Liberty to meet him and greet him. So... I'll be a little late for that one. I have a wedding rehearsal. So so that'll be Father Matthew's first Mass in our parishes on his own, which will be wonderful. But I have every confidence uh, in our MCs at St. Bridget. They are wonderful, and they will do a good job kind of just being with him, making him feel comfortable and right at home in our parishes. So so please do make time to go to those. And, and those will be the only Masses on those days offered um, between our three parishes. So and then we'll get back to kind of the regular weekday schedule the following week, I think. Nope, that's not true because I'll be gone on vacation the next week. Anyway, July is going to be a crazy month. I'll be gone two weeks in July. Um, not two weeks in a row, but I'll be gone one week for vacation uh, and then also one week for a retreat with the Priests of the Heart of Jesus, uh, which is a, um, a group of priests who are all diocesan priests, but we are, um, I'm, myself and three priests from our, arch, or two other priests from our archdiocese, we're discerning joining this group, thinking about, praying about joining this group. The priests of the heart of Jesus will still and always be priests of the archdiocese. I won't mess with our assignments. Um, it's just, it provides us with a rule of life that, that has really inspired us and also placed us in closer communion with one another through our priestly ministry. So, um, so yeah, we'll be joining uh, other priests of the heart of Jesus uh, from all over the United States will be having a retreat at Conception Abbey, so in uh, Missouri. Okay, that's enough about all that. Um, so yeah, but that's just to say July is going to be a crazy month. Father Matthew will have a few days off too. Keep in mind, just a warning, <laughs> 
Father Matthew, uh, you know, while it will be our first day seeing him Wednesday, July 5, he doesn't stop working. He's been working this entire year, right? So I am going to give him uh, and, and I've asked him to take a, take some days off in July um, that he's welcome. So it's days of vacation for him. I think he's having four or five days of vacation. So while it may seem odd that someone who just shows up gets some vacation time, uh, he has not stopped working um, this entire year. So so yeah, he's going to need a few days and it'll give him some days pretty early on just to maybe even get settled in a little bit more um, at the house. So, okay. On to a couple of questions, guys. Like I say, I didn't really uh, look through all the questions that are there, um, but the first two are fairly simple um, and, and want to just spend some time on those this evening. So our first one comes from Ashley Otto. Uh, she and her husband, Scott, are prisoners out at St. Bridget. Wonderful family. Uh, they have two kiddos, um, Aiden and Elena. Aiden is uh, kind of our uh, assistant MC at the masses at St. Bridget. So if you've ever been to the 8.15 a.m. mass on Sunday mornings at St. B's, you would have probably seen Aiden up there. Uh, he's the younger of the MCs. So uh, Ashley asks, or states then asks, <clears throat> we attended mass today out of town. First off, awesome. Uh, I want to commend Ashley and all of our parishioners that when you guys travel uh, in, in, in obviously you're traveling or whether it's sports or vacation or going to visit family, whatever it might be, I, I, I always love hearing, <laughs> hey, we were out of town, Father, sorry we missed you. But we did go to Mass. We saw this new parish. So many times parishioners will come up to me and share bulletins with them. Jane Jolliffe just shared one uh, the other day. Her and like her entire uh, family, all our kids, grandkids, which I heard her and Mark just had a great time. Uh, they were all able to go down south, uh, I think in Florida. Um, but they all went to church. And, and Jane brought back um, some bulletins and, and just some what she experienced there and got to share that with me a little bit. And it was wonderful. So... So well done, Ashley. Uh, out of town. I'm assuming it was sports. I think uh, Aiden plays plays baseball. So uh, they attended mass out of town. Well done. Uh, and the priest used a tablet, like an iPad, uh, instead of a missile for the Eucharistic prayers on the altar. So, so real quick. So what she's saying is they, the priest was saying the prayers. Like when you see the priest up at the altar during the Eucharistic prayer, uh, that's the part where we're standing. Then we also kneel. Right. Um, in, in, in the, the bread and wine are consecrated. It's that kind of second half of the mass after the homily. So um, she's saying that the priest used a tablet or an iPad rather than the big red book, the Roman Missal, um, to to say those prayers. And so she's asking, is is that allowed? Like, is that permissible? Um, and, and, and certainly. It is, it is allowed, right? There's nothing in the church's rubrics that says you must use the big red book or the Roman Missal for the prayers to be set out of. Of course, that is the preference. Uh, that's why those books are so well put together. They're incredibly expensive, uh, but they're very nice books. They're bindings that are durable uh, and they last years and years. Um, and, and, and they're just, you know, a little bit more pleasing to the eye, not as jarring uh, as, as say, like an, an iPad. So it's certainly uh, the preference that the Roman Missal, the actual book itself, would be used besides an iPad or a tablet. But it's not forbidden. It's not forbidden. Um, you could certainly call it like tacky and something that's going to distract because it's just so foreign, right? We're not used to seeing you know, an electronic tablet up there. I just, I remember like during uh, when we were doing live streaming masses, you know, I, I, I could never get used to the fact that there was always a computer screen in the early days when the church was closed, you know, there's a computer screen right in front of me. I could never get used to the fact that I'm like staring at a computer screen during uh, what is the, the holiest moment of that day, what is going to be, you know, the, when, when heaven touches earth. I could never get used to uh, when the church is open back up, that there was like a computer, you know, stage left, so to speak, sanctuary left, my left. It, it's just, it's jarring and you just don't get used to it. And I would expect that like, 
coming to a parish and you see a priest use a tablet or an iPad up there, it's, it's going to be jarring and it's going to appear tacky and distracting. Like, what's going on? Never seen this. Um, which is always the danger of, of kind of novelty and innovation um, that, that when we use things that aren't normally used or commonly used across parishes, cultures, um, it is. It's going to just jar people. Um, I mean, I would think if that priest regularly use it, uses it, his parishioners are probably used to it. But um, but there could also be reasons why a priest might use it. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have celebrated masses um, for many days in a row with an iPad. Um, and that was when I was in Mexico studying uh, Spanish down there. And I had been celebrating the sacraments for 10, 11 weeks all of them in Spanish. Um, and then my last week, I went to a different city and school down in, um, it was in the city and state of Oaxaca, Oaxaca. Um, so the state of Oaxaca and the capital city of, and its capital city is also called Oaxaca. And so my last week there, I didn't stay at the parish and I wasn't staying at a parish and I wasn't doing any sort of like explicit priestly ministry. So what I did that last week to celebrate masses um, because I didn't have an English missile, nor did I have uh, a Spanish Roman missile with me. I did have my iPad and the entire mass uh, is on this wonderful app called iBrevery that you can say the entire mass utilizing that app. There's some clicks and things that you got to do along the way, but, uh, but it was really helpful. And I was really grateful for that app. I'll say it felt super awkward celebrating mass from my iPad uh, in the room where I was staying. Um, it's always awkward to celebrate mass in, 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 in a room that's not a church, but, but it was especially awkward and, and odd celebrating it from the iPad. So, so that's like one kind of one off example. Another example of when it, you could maybe see a priest regularly using an iPad or a tablet is if he has like visual problems that he has problems with his eyesight, because as you know, we can, uh, especially with that eye breviary app, not only can you like zoom in, you can just with your fingers uh, increase the size of that font so that it's much more easily seen and therefore read for folks and, and priests or anyone that, that might be using it with some just uh, visual impairments. So, so those would just be a couple things off the top of my head. But back to the fact like, it is certainly not the preference. It is certainly not envisioned by the church that, that we would regularly be using uh, such things unless it's necessary, unless and unless there's good reason for it. So uh, this is the reason the church always contracts with publishers and makes sure that we have really nice uh, Roman missiles and uh, because that's that's been the custom for so long. So great question, Ashley. Again, tip of the hat uh, to the Otto family for going to Mass when they were out of town making plans for that. Okay. Uh, second and last question I'll handle tonight. Does transubstantiation occur at the elevation or at the epiclesis? And this question is submitted anonymously. The parishioner says, I've heard it both ways. So namely that transubstantiation occurs at the elevation. They've also heard that it occurs at the epiclesis. Someone else heard it was actually during the Jesus words and didn't depend on the elevation. This is a fantastic question. Uh, and it's kind of like one of those detailed nitty gritty questions. When does the bread become the body of Jesus? When does the wine become the blood of Jesus, his precious blood? Um, so like I say, great question. Transubstantiation though, big word. Uh, so trans meaning change, substantiation coming from the Latin to uh, English, which is substance, a change of substance. So trans change, substa uh, substantiation, substance, the change of the substance of the thing that the bread substantially in its essence changes into the body of Jesus. And he is fully present in our midst through the Eucharist, through that host, what is no longer bread now right? Because it's been substantially changed. And then the wine substantially changes from wine to the blood of Christ. Christ is fully present in what is now 
the precious blood. It is no longer wine. His entire essence, his entire self, even his body present in the blood, even his blood present in the body. This is why we don't have to receive both elements at mass, right? That we can receive just the host, the consecrated host, and receive the fullness of Christ because Christ is fully present just in the host. We can receive the precious blood and we can and, and just the precious blood and receive the fullness of Christ because he's fully present in the precious blood. Um, so that's transubstantiation. Uh, so that's a big word, but that just simply means the change, right? That these elements, bread and wine, substantially in their essence change into Jesus, fully present in our midst. And they are no longer the elements that they once were. They are no longer bread. They are no longer wine. So her question, though, is when does this like actually happen? Does it happen um, at the uh, does it happen at the elevation? Right. So right after I'll typically bend over the host and I'll bend over the chalice and say, take this all of you and eat of it. Take this all of you and drink from it. Right. So after each of those times, I elevate the host and then I elevate the chalice for just some moments in silent adoration? Does it happen then at the elevation? Does it happen at the epiclesis? So the epiclesis, we got to back up a bit in the mass, uh, not too far, but that's that point in the mass when I bring my hands down over the bread and wine, which are, well, that gives it away. Well, but it's when I bring my hands down over the altar, right? And that is symbolic uh, the epiclesis is the calling down of the Holy Spirit. So when you see my hands go down, and we oftentimes will hear a server ring ring the bell once during that time, That's that bell is there announcing the presence of the Holy Spirit that I am in the epiclesis calling down the Holy Spirit upon these elements. Um, or does it happen at Jesus' words? So in between the epiclesis and in between the elevation, are the Jesus words, as the parishioner says. That's when I am kind of hunched over the, the bread, speaking the words of Christ. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is my blood, the blood of the new. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. I forget. Yeah, the words slipped my mind. But this is my blood, right? When I'm bowed down over the chalice. So it's a great question. So some people say at the elevation, some people say at the epiclesis, some people say at the Jesus words. It is, in fact, at the end of the Jesus words over each of the two elements that the Eucharist becomes the Eucharist. Um, that it is no longer bread. It's in that moment at the end of do this in memory of me. Boom. That's as soon as I get done with those words. That's immediately when I elevate so that everyone throughout the entire church can clearly see Jesus is right there. You know, that question we have maybe had in our hearts this week, maybe in weeks or months or years prior, where are you, God? He's right there. Um, it's right after, as the parishioner uh, very charmingly called it, the Jesus words. Um, so that's the moment, uh, if you're looking for the moment. So great question. Um and yeah, great questions uh, this evening. So I apologize, guys. That, uh, normally I go like 45, 52 hours on these things. Um, but I just didn't have much time to prepare, guys. And I apologize. It's just going to be uh, a crazy, crazy uh, next week. Um, I would ask your, your, your patience as we kind of move into July. Uh, July is going to be, I've, I've blocked out all my calendars so that no one can really set up appointments through that little link just so uh, that I can kind of get my, get my bearings uh, going back and forth, kind of getting into a groove and getting into a schedule. Also just making sure that father Matthew gets settled in, making sure I have plenty of time with him uh, so that he can feel comfortable and feel confident um, and feel like he's ready to roll um, come August. So, so uh, he will be available to everyone and, and I'm really excited but like I mentioned this past weekend, he is excited. Uh, Father Matthew, like his 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 excitement level, like his normal excitement level, is ten levels above everyone else's normal excitement level. 
Um, so he's just a really, really excitable guy. I was with the parishioner uh, today at a funeral service, uh, and and he commented on that. He had actually had a chance to meet Father Matthew and just just really enjoyed that opportunity to meet with him and commented just how excitable and joy filled he is. So um, so yeah, it'll be it'll be wonderful. But please do uh, be patient in 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 the month of July. Uh, we'll both be kind of in and out of the parishes. We're going to both be trying to get settled in. Um, and I'm especially going to be kind of watching out, making sure he's he's feeling settled, especially. So I want him to to have the best possible chance of just being being a great priest for these parishes. Um, so I want to make sure I'm spending a lot of time with him in the coming month. So um, otherwise, also just a heads up to on uh, all day adoration. Uh Normally, we would have all-day adoration next week because that's going to be the first Tuesday and the first Friday of the month. But because it is July 4th week and there's there, there are people that travel um, quite a bit during this time, we're going to push it to the following week. So in July, heads up to the Guardians, it's going to be the second Tuesday and the second Friday of the month. And I'll get you those dates. So at St. Gabriel, we will not have all-day adoration July 4, but rather... We will have it July 11. So it'll be that Tuesday, July 11, starting after the morning mass until uh, just before the Wednesday evening mass at St. B's. We'll have it uh, Friday, July 14, starting right after the morning mass and benediction on Saturday morning, the 15th. So, so yeah. Um, and there will be no adoration on July 4 because it is a national holiday. Um, so we won't have adoration on July 4th, just so folks uh, can be with their families um, and, and I'll be kind of running around just moving. I don't know if I'll be in Rushville at that point or, yet or not. So, all right, guys, I hope you all have a great evening uh, If and whenever you watch this. If you watch this, listen to it. Uh, I hope you're having a great day or evening or night, whatever time of day it is. God bless you all. And when with the glory be, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. See you guys.